Welcome to Raw Online. Today I will be speaking about cervical myelopathy. I will be dealing the topic in following headings, history, anatomy, epidemiology, pathophysiology, clinical signs and symptoms, classification, differential diagnosis, investigation and treatment. So understanding about cervical myelopathy is very very important. How it started in history wise, uh, the importance regarding behind it, how it came into picture is first in 1892 when Sir William Richard Gower thought that it is just the vertebral body changes in cadaveric findings. He thought the changes in the vertebral body is due to chronicity and it is a result of an infection. That's why it, it was initially coined as pondylolitis. Later, Dr. Victor Alexander Horsley had seen a same year he had seen a patient with two months history of quadriparesis. And he thought it would be there might be a, some blockage at cervical level. And he was the one who performed first time laminectomy to decompress the neural structure single level. That's the first work he has done. But still the pathophysiology was not clear. It was in 1928 they understood it is a degenerative cascade which has resulted into these problems. Term was later coined as pondylosis. And uh, that is nothing but the cord changes, compression of the cord and the impingement of the cord causing symptoms, myelopathy symptoms. And in 1952, they recognized myelopathy, radiculopathy as well as axial neck pain are the symptoms of this degenerative cervical pathology. Now, before jumping into cervical myelopathy, you should understand the rele relevant anatomy behind this. Now you can see this is a, a typical cervical body where you can see this is a cervical a vertebral body. Uh, so the typical vertebral body is nothing but C3 to C6. Okay. And uh, you can see that this part is called as lateral mass. This whole thing including the foramen transversorium. And uh, this part of the facet is called as superior facet and this one down you are seeing is inferior facet. And this part is known as lamina and this is a spinous process and you can see that it has a bifid, spinous process has bifid process. And this foramina transversorium harbors the vertebral artery. So same you can see with the neural structures here. Uh, you can see the, this is the spinal cord with the nerve coming out and uh, you can see this, this is the foramen transversorium. These are the facet joints with the lateral masses. Okay, facet joint superior as well as inferior. This is the lamina. This is a bifid spinous process till here and this is a vertebral body and this is a disc. So this much of osseous anatomy should be known. More than this, you should know about two major joints in this aspect. One is the uncovertebral joint and second is the facet joint. Now you know this facet joint is nothing but the capsular joint right here and uh, it has been supplied by uh, a medial bundle branch which is coming from the root itself whereas the disc here you can see you, it is supplied by sinovertebral small small nerve coming from uh, postganglionic uh, nerve is supplying that that is called a sinovertebral uh, nerve that mainly supplies the annulus of the cervical disc and it is more rich in posterior aspect rather than anterior aspect. Then Next thing you should know is the uncovertible joint. Now what is uncovertible joint? Now you can see a small elevation here at the lateral aspect of the joint. Now this is a, actually a false joint. This is actually not a joint with a synovium or a capsule. This is a, since the disc is there, this region of the elevation in the projection in the bone on the lateral aspect is literally not that much uh, into the touch, into the vicinity. But once the disc dehydration occurs, the the uh, what happens is there is a friction at the level of uncovertebral joint, creating a hard osteophyte, and then compressing the cord or the root, causing myelopathy or radiculopathy. Now you should also know that uh, this whole system, the superior facet, the inferior facet, is totally called as, uh, including the foramen transversum, is also the, uh, totally called as the lateral mass. So, lateral mass is very much used for putting screws for stabilization or else the part here 
next posterior to the foramen transversum here what you see is the pedicle so that to uh, when the lateral mass is not when we are not able to put lateral mass screws the other access to the body uh, for putting the instrumentation is what you can do is you can put a pedicle screw now other than this there are ligaments which are responsible for the biomechanics of cervical spine one is the ligamentum nuque which is in the posterior aspect where the total cervical musculature originates from and second thing is you can see uh, that is anterior to this spinous process or the lamina is the ligamentum flavum that runs across posteriorly and then posterior to body there is one more ligament which is very very important is PLL ok. So, any rent in PLL and the disc fragment is escaping and coming to the cord and compressing it that is nothing but your regular soft disc or the disc prolapse which occurs in young people. So, so this much of anatomy is should be known before jumping into the uh, pathophysiology of myelopathy and understanding the treatment and 